uh, Mike Yarbrough. I'm a math professor here um, at, at CRC. I really appreciate you guys coming today. We're going to be doing uh, four main points today. Um, spontaneous generation and probability is the first one. Okay, so we're going to be talking about how likely is it that life could have started randomly by random chance without an intelligent designer. We're going to be talking about Darwin and this mathematician named Riemann. So we're going to look into Darwin's theory of evolution and how sound that is or isn't. Um, we're going to talk about the age of the earth. So how old is the earth? Okay. And then finally, we're going to talk about biblical prophecy and probability. So there are, we're going to get into that, but there were hundreds of prophecies or predictions made about the Messiah, which is the leader and savior that was promised in the Hebrew Bible. And we're going to talk about um, how likely is it that a random person who is not the Messiah could have just stumbled into the fulfillment of all of those prophecies. So those are the four main topics. Okay. Um, so I'm a math professor. I've been teaching here for about 20 years. Um, more importantly, though, I'm a Christian. And I give a talk almost every year that we have Math Awareness Week. Uh, usually I talk about something kind of math related, but more on the fun side. Okay. Um, but about a year ago, I kind of started feeling God was calling me to step out of my comfort zone and to combine mathematics with my Christian belief. And so since then, I've been working on this talk. And here we are. Um, so we're going to start with some definitions. Um, faith is a word that has m multiple definitions. Um, could be confidence or trust in a person or thing. It could be belief that is not based in proof, or it could be belief in God or the doctrines uh, or teachings of religion. Um, the one I'm going to use the most today is that second one, okay? Belief not based in proof. So when I say faith, I'm probably talking about that definition. Uh, a couple other ones. These are also on your handout. Um, an atheist is a person who rejects belief in God, okay? An agnostic is a person who believes nothing is known or nothing can be known about the nature of God. This, this person has neither faith nor disbelief in God. A deist is a person who believes in God, but a God that doesn't interact with, with humans. Okay? And then a theist is someone who believes in God, and this, this person believes in a God who does interact with, with humans, uh, operates within, within the world here. Um, and then the last definition there is a Christian. Okay, so a Christian is a theist who also is a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay? This is a person who is saved, who exhibits a changed life, who walks in faith, who shares the gospel with people, and who helps try to teach others how to live like Christ. So I want to make it very clear. It is very possible for someone to be a theist but not a Christian. Okay, so let's just make that distinction first. Um, the whole recurring theme throughout the talk today is going to be that there is clear, sound logic and reason for believing what the Bible tells us. Okay? And conversely, I'm going to argue that the logic behind the belief that there is no God is very shaky and is not very statistically sound. Okay? In other words, I hope to show that atheists have a belief that is not backed up very well by logic, mathematics, and probability. The main point today will be that it takes a whole lot of faith to be an atheist. Um, so we're going to start with the Bible verse here. It says, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Okay. So for anyone here who is a Christian, it's my hope that my talk today will strengthen your walk with Christ and also provide you with some ways you can defend your faith. Uh, for anyone here who is not a Christian, I hope that you will just hear me out and, and give thoughtful consideration to what I'm saying today. Okay. So that part about gentleness and respect, I just want everyone to know I'm speaking today out of love for each one of you. I think every person in here has worth, has value, and you were made in God's image. Okay. And I think the greatest way to show love to somebody is to tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ. So, spontaneous generation and probability. Okay. How likely is it that life could have started by random chance without an intelligent designer? Um, I want to think back to when you were young. Okay. Let's say you woke up one morning and you were going to have some alphabets. That's that cereal with all the letters. Okay. Um, but you go down and as you get 
closer to the kitchen and you get in the kitchen, you notice that the alphabets are knocked over and that note is right there with the alphabets. The alphabets make up that note, okay? Um, now you start to think, I got a lot of stuff going today. Like, do I really want to vacuum the house and water the plants? I got a busy day today, right? So you start to think, maybe my mom didn't write that note. Maybe that alphabets box just like knocked over like an earthquake happened and then it just happened to spill out like that. That's possible, right? Um, or maybe the cat just kind of knocked it over, okay? So what I'm saying is you should probably just ignore that, right? We should probably just ignore that note and go about our day and assume that was just happened randomly, okay? Um, well, what is the probability that that could have happened randomly? Let's talk about that. So let's get into some math here. Um, the specific letters that actually make up that note are given right there. So there's five A's up there. There's no B's. There's one C, one D, six E's, and so on, okay? I think there's 40 total letters up there, okay? Um, so if we're going to go through some math, we're going to do some probability right now. Um, let's assume that those are the only 40 letters in the box. That's a big jump also, but let's pretend that that's the only 40 letters in the box, okay? And so let's see what is the probability they could have spelled out and made that note, okay? Um, it's going to be a lot of fractions here, okay? Um, there were what? There were, there were two P's, right? And so out of the 40 letters, there's a two out of 40 chance that one of those P's could have fell in that first spot, okay? Um, there are uh, two L's, that's the next letter. Um, so out of the 39 letters remaining after the P got put there, there's a two out of 39 chance that that P could have gone in that next spot, okay? And I'm not gonna go through every single one, but you see how that works, right? And you see that uh, I eventually turned it into a decimal. I did a lot of math there. I eventually turned it into a decimal. Um, it's a one out of that number chance that that could have happened, right? Um, it's a one out of two followed by 37 zeros. That's the, that's the chances. That can also be said one out of 20 undecillion. I think that's also in your handout right there. So that's what we call that number. One out of 20 undecillion, okay? Let's try to get a, an idea of how big 20 undecillion actually is, okay? Um, let's say you wanted to count to 20 undecillion and you were able to count one per second and you didn't take any breaks, you didn't sleep or anything like that. Um, how long would that take you? Well, you could count 60 in a minute, you could count 3,600 in an hour, all the way up to 31 million something in a year. So if we took 20 undecillion and we divided by that 31 million number, we get about 600 octillion is what we call that number, okay? It would take about 600 octillion years to count to 20 undecillion. That means if we could somehow pour the cereal out randomly, read it, put it back in the box, shake it up and pour it out again, and every time somehow it came out different, it would take about 600 octillion years, if we could do that once per second, it would take about 600 octillion years until we could have all the different possi possibilities, right? The, the largest estimates for the age of the Earth are about four and a half billion years, okay? Which is only about 10 digits instead of all those digits that you see right there, okay? Now, let's talk about something else that might have happened by random chance or might have been intelligently designed, right? So, like, I hope we would agree that probably that note was intelligently designed, probably by mom, right? It probably didn't happen randomly. So, let's talk about something else that might have happened randomly or maybe not randomly. So, let's take Mount Rushmore. Um, hold up, hold up, that's the wrong one. Oh, Mount Rushmore, okay? <laughs> What are the chances that Mount Rushmore maybe could have been just created, just randomly? Like, I don't think anyone's gonna buy that, right? No one's gonna look at that and say, yeah, I think that just happened. Nature just made that happen, right? I think everyone's gonna say, there's a designer. Design demands a designer. I think everyone's gonna say that about Mount Rushmore and the cereal, okay? I think that to think that the cereal or Mount Rushmore happened by chance, that would take a whole lot of faith, okay? And I don't have enough faith to believe something like that, right? I don't think that happened by random chance. Okay, so what do alphabets and Mount Rushmore have to do with Christianity, okay? Um, let's talk about how life might have begun, okay? Uh, Christians believe what the Bible tells us, and the Bible tells us 
God created the heavens and the earth. That's what, that's what we, we learn in Genesis. Most atheists don't believe that. Most atheists say uh, spontaneous generation. That's what happened. Okay? Spontaneous generation is the belief that organisms spontaneously generated living organisms came directly from non-living matter. Okay? That it happened and that all happened by chance. That's called spontaneous generation. There was a famous uh, atheist and biochemist named George Wald who won a Nobel Prize. He was quoted as saying, one has only to contemplate the magnitude of this task to concede that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. Yet here we are as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. Okay, so this person uh, says he believes spontaneous generation is impossible, yet he says that he thinks that's what happened. Okay, that would be pretty hard for myself to reconcile that in, in my mind. Um, there's some people who will make the argument, well, of course it's not a very good chance that life is just going to sort of make itself randomly out of nothing. Um, but over time, it'll happen. And if you give it enough time, it'll happen. And four billion years is enough time. Okay, so I want to talk about that. I think there's a big problem with that. Um, over time, what nature does, it doesn't really order things. Over time, nature has a tendency to disorder things. Um, in fact, uh, we call that the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, so that says uh, the level of disorder in the universe is steadily increasing and systems tend to move from ordered behavior to more random behavior. Okay, so I think that's a good example of why that argument that maybe giving it more time will make it a better chance that it'll happen. I actually think giving it more time will make it a worse chance that it might happen. So here's another example for that. Let's imagine you you took an airplane and you had a bunch of red, white, and blue confetti and you went about a thousand feet above your house and you were just going to pour out the confetti and you were hoping it would make the American flag on your front lawn. Okay? Um, I think most people would agree that no, that's probably not going to happen. Right? Um, pretty low, right? Because nature is just going to kind of mix up the confetti and randomize it. The evolutionist or the atheist or the Darwinist might say, just allow more time, then it'll probably happen, if you allow enough time. So let's take that plane now up to 10,000 feet. If we take that plane up to 10,000 feet, there's definitely more time for nature to work on it as it falls. But does that improve the probability that it's going to make the flag? I don't think so. I think it actually makes it worse, right? I think that actually makes it worse because nature has a tendency to disorder and to randomize things. Okay. So what exactly does need to take place for life to happen? Okay. Um, the basic unit of all living organisms is called the cell, and cells are made up of thousands of components. One of these is, is protein. Okay. Proteins are large molecules made up of a chain of amino acids. Um, in order to get a protein to be useful for life, the correct amino acids have to be linked together in the correct order. Okay. Um, Turns out getting all the correct acids to be linked in the correct order is not easy. That's not an easy process. Okay? They contain very specific arrangements of amino acid. So we're going to talk about the probability of getting just one single protein randomly. Okay? There's actually over 300 different types of amino acids out there, and only 20 of them are used to make life. That means there's 280 of them that don't work. So we have to be very selective. Okay? Um, each type of, uh, type of amino acid comes in two shapes, and they're commonly called left-handed forms and right-handed forms. Um, the thing is, though, only left-handed forms are used to make biological proteins. Okay? Um, also, they tend to just bond randomly. So they need to be in the correct order, or the protein won't function. Okay? So how probable is it that even a single protein could evolve from a random pool of chemicals. Let's talk about that. Okay. It turns out the proteins range from 50 amino acids to about 30,000 amino acids. So we're going to talk about a pretty small one, a really small one of just 100. Okay. To get a very small protein of 100 left-handed amino acids from an equal mixture of left and right-handed, that's kind of the same thing as flipping a coin and getting the same thing 100 times in a row. Think about that, right? If there's random left and right-handed things, and we're going to randomly pick and hope to get 100 left-handed ones in a row. It's the same as flipping a coin and, say, getting 100 heads or 100 tails 
in a row. So what are the chances that maybe we could flip a coin and maybe we get 100 heads in a row? Okay, if, if someone were to do that, if you had like a bet with one of your friends and they flipped a coin and they got 100 in a row, would you say just like, oh, good job, like that's pretty cool, right? Or would you say, I kind of think that's not random. I kind of think there's a design to that, like somebody made that happen, right? Um, each, each individual flip is one half chance that we might get a heads, okay? So the first flip, there's a half, one out of two. Second flip, there's a one out of two chance. Third flip, one out of two chance. A hundred times, right? So there's about a one out of two, and one half to the hundredth power, which turns out to be approximately this number, one out of, uh, we call that one nonillion. That's 30 zeros right there, okay? There's a one out of one nonillion chance that you're gonna get 100 heads in a row, okay? To give you an idea how unlikely that is, um, to, in order for you to flip a coin enough times that you would expect a string of 100 heads, you would have to flip a coin over 300,000 times per second for over, uh, actually I said that wrong, over 300 million times per second for over one quadrillion years. That's how many times and how fast you'd have to flip a coin in order to expect you would get 100 heads in a row. But that's, we're not even done yet because remember that one out of one nonillion, that only measures the probability that we'll just get 100 left-handed things, right? They still need to be in the right order and they still need to be from you know, the proper 20 that work out of the 300. So let's assume that we do have the 20 that work. We have a bunch of varieties, uh, a bunch of those varieties. Um, let's talk about uh, how are they gonna go in, in the proper order, okay? Um, remember, we're talking about just 100. This is a very small one, okay? Each position can be occupied by one of any of those 20, okay? But they gotta be in the right order. So the first one has to be one you know, particular one. So if we just have those types that work, we still have to pick the correct one out of the 20 to go right here. And then we still have to pick the correct one out of the 20 types to go in the next spot and so on, okay? So there's about a one out of 20 to the 100th power chance. So that makes it a lot worse. This is your chances that you can get just one small protein, okay? Um, that, by the way, is basically zero, okay? In fact, mathematicians would pretty much call that zero. There's a guy named Emile Borel who came up with the universal probability bound and it says anything with probability less than one out of 10 to the 50 should, be, should not be attributed to random chance. What he's saying is if you do something and it happens but the probability of it is less than one out of 10 to the 50, somebody made that happen. That's what he said, okay? Now that's a math and statistics thing. Um, that has nothing to do with religion. I don't even know what this guy believes but that's what mathematicians and statisticians would say, okay? Anyways, um, we only looked at a single small protein, okay? If you were gonna get all the proteins necessary for life by random chance, it would actually be about one out of 10 to the 100 billionth power, okay? So like one out of one with 100 billion zeros after it, okay? I thought it'd be nice to have a visual of that, okay? So I asked um, my computer to do a pie chart and we could compare a couple things. So I asked my computer to do one out of eight. You can see the visual over there on the left-hand side. Okay, that represents one out of eight. And then I asked my computer to do one out of 10 to the 100 billionth power and to shade in that part, that little slice on this one. So you see that little, like, that little green slice on the right there? No, I don't either, okay. Um, so I can tell you that I don't have enough faith to believe that all the proteins necessary for life might have happened by random chance. One last thing to ponder on this topic, it's estimated that humans, our body is made up of about 60 trillion cells. Um, it has more than 40 billion small blood vessels and if we laid them out, it would extend over 25,000 miles. It has a heart that, can, that pumps over 100,000 times a day. It contains eyes and ears that are more complex than any man-made machine. And it also has a brain that has over 100 trillion interconnections. Okay. Believing that 60 trillion cells were just assembled by random chance to form a human is a really giant leap of faith. And I'm not willing to believe that happened randomly. However, 
an all-powerful creator told, told us in the Bible that he is the intelligent designer, that he designed us. Okay? So, despite the insurmountable odds of even a single cell forming randomly, let's temporarily assume that that single cell did happen randomly, and let's see what we need for what we call evolution to take place. Okay? So, next topic here, um, Darwin and Riemann. Um, so, in 1859, um, Darwin wrote a book called On the Origin of Species. Okay? I have a lot of books in the back table there if you want to check them out after. Um, I think that's one of them back there. Um, and in your handout is a, is a quick summary of the book, so I'm not going to focus on everything. I'm just going to focus on the, the last slide. So I'm not really going to talk about this. That's all in your handout. Uh, I'm only going to focus on the last bullet point. Okay? The last bullet point, according to Darwin, he said, this slowly effected process results in populations changing to adapt to their environments, and ultimately, these variations accumulate over time to form new species. Okay, so that's what Darwin said. That, that is not a fact. That's what Darwin believed probably happens. Okay, and Darwin even said that is not a fact. Okay, that's not, that's not my words. Darwin said that's not a fact. And Darwin said his theory cannot be counted as truth unless all of the bullet points become facts. And this is the big problem one, okay? So Darwin himself, Charles Darwin himself, believed that unless we find evidence that species turned into new species, the theory of evolution is invalid, okay? And understand, so back in 1859, Charles Darwin only proposed a theory, okay? In fact, Charles Darwin has two chapters in his book that addresses how the required evidence for this theory is actually missing. Okay. Darwin assumed the evidence would be there in the future. Um, we are now 160 years in the future, and it's still not there. Okay. Um, Darwin's own book argues sometimes against, against evolution. He says right here, this is in chapter 6, to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems absurd in the highest possible degree. That's in Charles Darwin's book. He also says in chapter 6, why if species have descended from other species, by insensibly fine gradations, do we not everywhere see innumerable transitional forms? And why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the earth? Okay, so this is Darwin saying, if my theory is gonna be true, we have to find that evidence in the fossil records, these innumerable transitional forms from one species to another. Um, that evidence was not there in 1859, okay? It is still not there today. Darwin knew that in 1859. I think a lot of atheists today wrongly view Charles Darwin as some sort of a hero or a leader, but let's actually talk about what we do know about Darwin's views on God. Um, Darwin said, I have never denied the existence of God. I think the greatest argument for the existence of God is the impossibility of demonstrating that the universe and man were the result of chance. Now, Charles Darwin actually changed his mind about his belief in God a few times. In fact, growing up, he went to the Church of England school, and he went to the University of Cambridge because he was planning to be a pastor. That's what Charles Darwin wanted to do. Um, at that point, we could definitely call him a theist. Okay? Um, his wife, who also happens to be his first cousin, was a devout Christian, and um, however, uh, most of, for most of his life after he decided not to become a pastor, Charles Darwin was switching back and forth between an agnostic and a deist, okay? Um, so that's usually what he was. He was either a theist or a deist or an agnostic, and he kind of changed his mind several times. So anyways, Charles Darwin's name is still uh, uh, synonymous with evolution, but what exactly does evolution mean? Let's, let's ask that question, do you believe in evolution? Okay, you don't have to raise your hand. It's a really intricate question. Consider these definitions. Uh, evolution is the gradual development of something. Species is a category of biological classific classification comprising organisms potentially capable of interbreeding. Microevolution is evolutionary change within a species. Macroevolution is major evolutionary change from one species to become another species. Okay, so there's a difference between micro and macroevolution. We're going to talk about that right now. A classic example of microevolution is, is what we call Darwin's finches. Okay, so Charles Darwin in 1835, he was studying the wildlife on the Galapagos Islands. And he noticed that the finches 
on the islands were basically the same, but they had some variation in the size of their beaks and their claws. Okay? His theory was if there was less food on an island, eventually their beaks and claws would grow longer so they could, they could dig deeper and find their food. Okay? And those minor changes, they were observed, right? But the key point is the bird was still a bird. It, it is why we call it microevolution, right? Now, if Darwin would have found evidence or would have observed his bird, say, turning into an alligator, that would be an example of macro evolution. Okay? Macro evolution involves the belief that all life forms descended from a common ancestor, which is the first one-celled creature. And on top of that, it all happened naturally without any intelligent intervention. So Darwin's uh, finches are an example of microevolution. For another example of microevolution, consider what happens to bacteria when it's attacked by antibiotics. When, when bacteria survive a bout with antibiotics and they multiply, that's because that parent bacteria possessed the capacity to resist the antibiotics. So the sensitive bacteria die off, the surviving bacteria multiply, and they now dominate. Evolutionists say that surviving bacteria represents evolution. That's true, but what kind of evolution, right? The answer is absolutely critical. In fact, it probably represents the greatest point of confusion in the whole creation versus evolution controversy. So here's what observation tells us. The surviving bacteria always stay bacteria. That's microevolution. They do not evolve into some other type of organism, which would be macroevolution. Despite that microevolution, despite that it is microevolution, evolutionists claim that shows macroevolution. Evolutionists say that these observable micro changes, we should be able to extrapolate that to prove that unobservable macro evolution can occur from one species to another. They make no distinction between microevolution and macroevolution. They use evidence for micro to prove macro. As a result, evolu evolutionists can confuse a lot of people into thinking any observable change in any organism proves that all life came from the original one-celled creature. They are very good at defining the term evolution broadly enough so that evidence in one situation can be counted as evidence in another. So, Based on the evidence, I would have to say, I definitely do believe in microevolution. I do not believe in macroevolution. Charles Darwin published his, his um, theory in 1859. There's a famous mathematician who also came out with something big in 1859. That's Bernard Riemann, okay? Um, Bernard Riemann came up with something we now call the Riemann hypothesis. So in math, a hypothesis or a conjecture, that's like an idea that someone has, but it hasn't been proven to be true yet, okay? A theorem is what we're supposed to call it once it's been proven to be true. So, mathematically speaking, Darwin's idea is currently at the hypothesis stage, since it has, has not been proven, um, and it's been there for 160 years. Regarding this guy's thing, there's something called the Riemann zeta function. I'm not gonna get too much into that, you will thank me for that. That's what it looks like, that's the Riemann zeta function. Um, it's it's an infinite series where S is supposed to represent a complex number, okay? Um, Riemann believed that, and, and the whole idea is when is that thing equal to zero? Riemann believed that thing is equal to zero when the real part of the complex number is half. When the real part of the complex number, when the uh, A right there is equal to a half, he says that's when we might get a zero. Every zero has the property that that A right there is a half. Believe it or not, the Riemann hypothesis is really important. It tells us a lot about the behavior of prime numbers. In fact, most mathematicians would say the Riemann hypothesis, I don't know if he really said that. Most mathematicians would say the Riemann hypothesis is probably the most important unsolved problem in mathematics. So to this day, no one has been able to prove the Riemann hypothesis. We're not sure if it's true or not. However, there's hundreds of, I'm gonna use quotes here, theorems that now exist whose statements begin by assuming the Riemann hypothesis is true. Because I, I shouldn't really call them theorems, right? They're not theorems because they rely on something that hasn't been proved yet, okay? And mathematicians understand that. Mathematicians understand that if the Riemann hypothesis is not eventually proved true, all of those quote-unquote theorems or those ideas would just collapse, 
right? So what's the parallel between Riemann, the Riemann hypothesis, and then what's going on with Darwin? Well, all those hundreds of theorems, theorems we mentioned, they rely on the truth of the Riemann hypothesis, which has not been proved. Just like Darwin's theory relies on the finding of those innumerable amount of fossils that show those intermediate states between the species, which has also not been proved, okay? Now, rules of logic are very important to mathematicians, okay? So if you were to tell a mathematician that one of those hundreds of theorems is true, uh, you would probably be laughed at because mathematicians understand, no, it's not true because it relies on something that we don't know if it's true or not, so we can't say that one's true. In other words, mathematicians definitely understand that if the truth of y depends on the truth of x, but x hasn't been proven true, we shouldn't be concluding that y is true, right? Evolutionists, however, don't really seem to mind overlooking little things like logic. Okay. Um, remember earlier we said that the uh, absolute largest uh, uh, estimate for the age of the Earth is about four and a half billion years, okay? We're gonna talk about that. Should that even matter? Should the age of the Earth even matter to us if, if we are a Christian? Um, well, Norman Geisler doesn't think so. Norman Geisler is a theologian who says, I don't think we should ever tie our faith to how old the earth is, right? I mean, I know that I would be a Christian no matter how old the earth is, okay? But I think this point we're about to get to is really important. If the age of the earth is not at least billions of years old, the theory of evolution is going to fall apart because the theory of evolution needs billions of years to work, to even have a chance at working. So, now for the most part, Education in America leans towards the ideologies of evolutionists and atheists. Um, so it should be no surprise that almost all science books in American education say that the Earth is billions of years old. Okay. There's, however, lots of evidence that the Earth might only be thousands of years old. Um, in fact, during my research, I came across about 100 pieces of evidence that it's only a thousand, thousands of years old. Okay. Don't worry, we're not going to look at all 100. We're going to look at four of them. Okay. Carbon dating. Carbon dating is the determination of the age of organic matter from the relative proportions of carbon-12 and carbon-14 that it contains. So in order for carbon dating to be accurate, we have to know the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14. We have to know what that ratio was in the environment in which our specimen lived. The problem is, ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14 is always changing, and it has not yet reached a state of equilibrium. Okay. So carbon dating, because of that, is usually only accurate up to a few thousand years. So if anyone is telling you that the Earth is billions of years old and they're using carbon dating as their reason, you should question that. There's not enough mud on the ocean floor. Okay? Every year, about 20 billion tons of dirt and rock kind of just accumulate on the ocean floor. About one billion of them are removed because the Earth's plates are shifting and they kind of just disappear in there. But the other 19 billion tons stay there. If the Earth were really billions of years old, the mud would actually should be miles and miles deep by now. It's about a thousand feet deep. Okay. Um, in 2005, researchers found a fossilized Tyrannosaurus rex. Many scientists initially said that's 65 million years old. But then they started to find flexible connective tissue. They started to find branching blood vessels and even intact cells. This became a big problem for evolutionists because it was well known biological material like that cannot last more than thousands of years. I'm gonna go a little deeper into this last one. We're gonna talk about the world population. Okay, you have this chart in your, in your handout. Um, so this chart tells you by year what the world population was. Right now, we're, we're past 7 billion now. Um, most textbooks teach that modern humans have been around for about 200,000 years. They think the Earth was around for a few billion years before humans came along. Um, let's see if that checks out. Okay. Um, generally, populations follow an exponential model, like an exponential curve like this. Okay. So like we often do in the intermediate algebra level or the statistics level, um, I went ahead and put all of that data into my TI-84 calculator, okay? Um, actually, I have the TI-84 plus, and maybe this is not the time to brag, but I have the silver edition. 
But anyways, um, I used what we call exponential regression. And I came up with a, a, an equation that models that data. And it's right up there on the top. Okay? So P is the world population on the left. And T, this, this uh, exponent right here, that's the year. Okay? So if we wanted to get like an idea of what the world population might have been in any given year, we can put the year right there. And then it will tell us approximately what the population was. Okay. That number right there, that's like, that's, we call it the multiplier in math. That means to get from one year to the next, if you know the population one year and you want to know what it's going to be the next, you can get a good estimate by multiplying by that number. A little bigger than one. Okay. So here's what I did. I decided I was going to work backwards with this. I came up with that on my calculator. I said, let me work backwards and see when P equals 2. Right? Because without two people, you know. <laughs> okay. So um, here's what I did. I put a 2 in the P spot right there. Okay, and I'm trying to solve for t, but t is up there. The problem with that is we need logarithms. If we're trying to solve for a variable that's up in the exponent, we need to take the log of both sides. Then we get to take that and put it in the front like that. Okay. Anyways, you can see what happens. I got negative 9125, right? What does that mean? What does that correspond to? Um, a lot of people would say, well, I guess that means negative, uh, I guess that means 9125 BC, right? Um, Actually, there's not a year zero, and I'm a total math nerd, so it technically refers to 9126 BC. But anyways, um, let's understand, we just got an estimated answer that says maybe humans started on the Earth about 11,000 years ago. We just used math, and we used the, 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 the exponential model. Maybe about 11,000 years ago is when humans first started. That's not even close to the 200,000 years ago that most evolutionists will claim. Okay. Here's the next thing I did. I said, okay, what if, what if they were right? What if 200,000 years ago there was two people? How many people would we expect there to be right now? Right? All we got to do is take that two, multiply it by that, that 1.00 number, right? multiply it by that thing a lot of times. In fact, 200,000 times. That's what we got to do. Right? Um, Here's what happens when we do that. If there really were two, two people and the Earth population was increasing like, like it has been for the last couple thousand years, we would expect this many people on Earth right now. Okay? And I'm a math professor and I don't even know how to say that number. So that's really big. That's a really big number. That's just 165 zeros right there. The actual current population of the Earth is about 7.5 billion. Not that. Okay. So, the main point, there's a lot of reason to believe maybe the Earth is only thousands of years old instead of billions. Okay. The claim that humans have been on the Earth for 200,000 years doesn't really seem to add up to me. Okay. Next topic, biblical prophecy and probability. So, now for this, for this last one, we're going to talk about how in the Bible there are about 300 prophecies or predictions made about the Messiah that ended up being fulfilled by Jesus. Okay? Christians believe that that fulfilled prophecy is good proof that Jesus is who he says he is, that he's our Messiah, our leader, our savior. Okay? Because the alternative would be to believe that Jesus is just some random guy who happened to just stumble into the fulfillment of all these prophecies. That's the alternative. Okay? Let's get back to some math. What if I asked you, what is four times five? You don't have to answer. Okay. If you asked me, though, I would say 20. Okay. What if someone else came along and say, it's 73? Would you be okay with that? Imagine someone came up and said, well, it may be true for you that four times five is 20, but it's true for me that four times five is 73. And you need to be inclusive and accepting of that. Now, that would sound crazy. Like, that would sound like crazy talk. I mean, can 4 times 5 really be 20 and 73 at the same time? Um, the answer is no, by the way. Um, two things that contradict each other cannot both be true. We call that the law of non-contradiction. Okay. Uh, I will say, working at a college, I hear a lot of people say things like, well, you may feel that that is true, but I feel that this is true. Okay. And the problem with that is things are true 
or not true, regardless of how we feel about them. In other words, truth doesn't care about your feelings. Okay? And, and so how is that related to religion? Right? Well, if this talk were going really smoothly, everyone in here would be a theist right now. Okay? A theist is someone who believes there is a single God. Um, you might say, but isn't there more than one religion that has a single God? Right? Isn't there more than one theistic religion? There's actually three major theistic religions. Okay? There's Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Okay? Can they all be true? Um, well, Christianity says Jesus is the Messiah, the leader and savior promised in the Hebrew Bible, awaited by the Jews. Judaism says Jesus is not the Messiah, but the Messiah hasn't come yet. Islam says Jesus is not the Messiah, but the Messiah hasn't come yet. Christianity says Jesus died a real death with, with much physical suffering. Judaism says Jesus died a normal death. Islam says Jesus never actually died. A disciple died in his place, and Jesus ascended into heaven. Okay. So my point here is they say different things, right? And I could go on and on with a lot of other examples, but they say different things. What does that mean? That means they can't all be true. That would, go, that would violate the law of non-contradiction, right? So I'm, I'm trying to say Christianity, Judaism, Islam, they can't all be true. Either, either none of them are true, or one of them is true. They can't all be true. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. So, um, we're going to look into some evidence right now in favor of Christianity. Okay. When Christians use the term Messiah, we are talking about the Savior predicted in the Old Testament of the Bible. Um, the term Messianic prophecy refers to a collection of about 300 prophecies or predictions in the Old Testament about the Messiah. Okay. I'm just going to show you a few examples. So back in, uh, well, in Genesis, the prophecy was that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. Okay? And then 1,500 years after that was written, that's what happened. Okay? That's, that's a fulfilled prophecy. The Messiah would be a descendant of King David. That was predicted. 645 years after that, that's what happened. Okay? The Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. That's what happened. 760 years after it was written, that's what happened. The Messiah is supposed to die in a brutal way, including his hands and feet being pierced. That happened 500 years after it was written. Okay. So in the Bible, the Old Testament, uh, that was written over about 1,200 years between 1600 and 400 BC. The New Testament, that we call the New Testament, was a period of 60 years, AD 35 to AD 95. And the accuracy of those dates is really important, right? Because I'm saying that all of the things were written in the Old Testament and then they came true later. So we got to be really careful about these dates, right? Um, there actually, believe it or not, has not really been much of a debate among scholars as to when the Old Testament was written, okay? Um, even Christian and non-Christian scholars pretty much agree with, with the dates I gave up there, okay? Um, however, between uh, 1946 and 1956, something really interesting happened because there were 981 different manuscripts discovered by the Dead Sea. Okay? Now we call them the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's what we call them now. Um, and then we did a bunch of different like, dating methods to see how old they were. And pretty much all scholars, including Christian and non-Christian, say they go back to around 300 B.C. Those scrolls were from around 300 B.C. Okay, why does that matter? Well, it matters because in those scrolls, it's quoting the Old Testament. Those Dead Sea Scrolls have quotes from the Old Testament. In fact, there are quotes from all of the Old Testament books except for Esther. Poor Esther. Okay. Um, that means the Old Testament had to be written before 300 B.C. Because the manuscripts are quoting them. Right? Now, some skeptics, they still aren't okay with that. They, they just don't trust anything, uh, any Christian when trying to prove Christianity. So sometimes... The best evidence for Christianity actually comes from non-Christian sources. Okay? There was a man named Josephus who was alive in A.D. 37 to A.D. 100. Um, even Josephus claims the books of the Old Testament were written hundreds of years before him. Josephus also tells us about Jesus. Okay? He said, there was a wise man called Jesus. His conduct was good. He was known to be virtuous. 
Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days later after the crucifixion and that he was alive. And accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah. That's what the Jewish historian Josephus said. In fact, uh, within 150 years of Jesus' life, there are about 10 non-Christian sources that, that talk about Jesus. Okay. By contrast, over that same period of time, there are only nine non-Christian sources who talk about Tiberius Caesar, who was the Roman emperor at that time. Um, this is also in your handout. You can look at that later. But there's about 24,000 handwritten ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. Nothing else from the ancient world even comes close to that. The next closest is the Iliad by Homer, which has 643. Okay. Besides the Iliad, most other ancient works survive on fewer than a dozen manuscripts, but historians basically never question the authenticity of those. Okay. The Bible was actually quoted so often in other ancient books that we could almost reconstruct the whole thing just from quotes. In fact, the entire New Testament, except for 11 verses, could be reconstructed just from other ancient books quoting it. Okay. I believe that the Dead Sea Scrolls affirm the authenticity of the Old Testament and the fact that it was written well before the time of Jesus. I believe non-Christian sources affirm the authenticity of the New Testament and the fact that it was written soon after the time of Jesus. Okay. All 300 of these proph prophecies were for fulfilled by the same person. His name is Jesus. Christians believe that proof, that is proof that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, to think otherwise, like I said, that would be to suggest Jesus is just some random guy who happened to fulfill all of those. So what's the probability of that happening? What's the probability of a random person just stumbling into the fulfillment of all 300 of those? Well, as an example, take one of the prophecies from, um, from earlier. The Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And that, that's what happened. Okay, um, So... That was written about 700 years before Jesus walked on earth. No one argues that. And no one argues that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. There were about a thousand villages in Israel at that time. So a reasonable estimate would be maybe about one out of a thousand is the chances that could happen. Right? All of the 300 have a very small chance like that. We're going to be very conservative, though, and we're going to give them all a one out of ten chance. Okay? So I'm trying to help the... Trying to help the atheist out a little bit. I'm going to give it a one out of 10 chance here. Okay. Um, so what would happen or what would be the chances that all 300 could be fulfilled by the same person by random chance? Well, if there's a one out of 10 chance that the first one could be fulfilled randomly and a one out of 10 chance that the second one could be fulfilled randomly and so on, we're multiplying one out of 10 times one out of 10, 300 times, right? It's, it's one out of 10 to the 300th power. Um, that's a one out of one followed by 300 zeros. That's what that is. Okay. How can we even begin to understand how small that number is? This is kind of the, this is going to wrap it up here. The, the answer lies inside the place that a lot of us like to call the happiest place on earth. Costco. Okay. <laughs> so what we're going to do, we're going to fill Costco with sand. We're going to fill up the whole thing with sand. Okay. Average size Costco, I looked it up, uh, is about a little over 7 billion cubic inches. It was actually feet cubic feet, and then I had to do a little math, I had to turn it into cubic inches. So, and a medium-sized grain of sand uh, has a volume of about that many cubic inches, really small. Okay, so to see how many grains of sand can we fit in Costco, we got to divide. We got to do that division. Um, it turns out we can fit about that many grains of sand in your average Costco. Okay, now I, I decided to round that number down. I rounded that number down to a one with 15 zeros after it. So I kind of turned those sevens into zeros. So I'm going to be a little conservative here, round that down. Let's suppose the store was filled with all white sand except for one single grain of red sand. Okay? And your job, and it's all mixed up, and you're blindfolded, and your job is to somehow like roam around Costco. You get to one choice. You get to pick out one, one grain of sand. Right? What's the probability it's red? Well... It's one out of 10 to the 15th. It's, a, it's one out of one with 15 zeros after it. That's what it is, right? But remember, we were talking about one out of one, out of, uh, uh, one with 300 zeros after it, right? And 300 divided by 15 equals 20. And so by the laws of exponents, we would have to multiply this number by itself 20 times to make that, that one out of 10 to the 300th. 
Okay? Here's what I'm saying. The probability that some random person could have stumbled into the fulfillment of all 300 messianic prophecies without this being orchestrated by God is the same as the probability of you picking out a single grain of sand in all white sand, but you got to pick out the red one, and you got to do this blindfolded, and you got to do it 20 times in a row. That's what has to happen. Okay? I don't have enough faith to believe that something like that could have happened. Okay? Fulfilled prophecy is powerful evidence that the Bible comes from God. The Bible is true. Okay? Lastly, I want you to imagine you have some sort of an animal in front of you. Okay? That animal looks like a dog. It sounds like a dog. It feels like a dog. It walks like a dog. And it smells like a dog. <laughs> Everything points to, that's a dog. Someone walks up. Someone comes along and says, that's not a dog. Okay? I think the burden of proof should fall on that person who's claiming that that is not a dog rather than on the person that's claiming that that is a dog. Okay. I think evidence points, a lot of evidence points to there being an intelligent designer of this universe. I think evidence points to there being a God. I think evidence points to Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins and rising from the dead three days later. Evidence points to the Bible and Christianity being true. In fact, as much evidence as there is, the burden of proof should lie with the people who are claiming otherwise. It is the atheists who are believing in something for which there is no proof. It's the atheists who must have a whole lot of faith. Okay? I don't have that kind of faith. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Okay? I would like to finish by saying a quick word to anyone here who's already a Christian. I would like to encourage you to not be afraid. I want you to go out. I want you to share your Christianity. I want you to defend Christianity and have a well-thought uh, explanation as to why you are a Christian. Okay? There's a lot of anti-Christian bias, especially at college campuses. Okay? Most college campuses reject Christian values, and at the same time, they embrace sinful behavior. The college culture is so worried about not wanting to offend anyone. Okay? Speaking the truth should be so much more important than your fear of offending somebody. Okay? I know it's not always easy. I just encourage you to be bold and go out and speak the truth. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you.